this is going to be a little less structured than the last talk, where maybe we have to intuit what our methods and conclusions and such. I tend to ramble, um, and I'm going to continue that tradition. Uh, so I think the, the key thing in this title to, to focus on is I'm going to look at, at the, towards the middle and end of the presentation that social barriers to mangrove restoration at the landscape level, and maybe defining landscape quickly as a social and ecological system. I think I want to start off talking a bit more of its ecological or biophysical nature. Um, so my research took place in, in an outer island and also in Java, in uh, Damak. This is, today I'm just going to focus on Gorontalo in the northern part of Sulawesi. Um, and this is the Tanjung Panjang landscape in Pohuato. In the year 2000, it was mostly mangrove. All that pink, my, my GIS specialist um, in Indonesia always portrays mangroves in pink, um, which is cool. Uh, so that was mangroves um, in 2000 before they were converted. And then by 2015, all that blue area is aquaculture ponds um, producing shrimp and milkfish. Um, and so we lost about 5,000 hectares. And I think what's even more interesting is this section of this former forest is a nature reserve, national nature reserve, Chagaralam, which on paper has the strictest protection in Indonesia. And this is a former district protected forest, which is now an integrated forest management unit controlled by the, at the provincial level. So we lost a lot of mangroves. Um, and that's what it looks like on the ground. Uh, my colleague took this, she's a good photographer at Blue Ventures also. Um, the glass, and this just, up, up there I, I show a figure of mangrove loss uh, throughout the world between that same time period roughly, and yellow is Asia. So this is a common phenomenon across Asia, Southeast Asia. Um, yeah, and that's a nature reserve. Uh, a lot of the conversion of mangroves in East Indonesia takes place from, emanates from South Sulawesi. Um, I didn't point out ethnic groups, but it's uh, mostly Bugis and Makassari, a little uh, Manda uh, ethnic groups who have a seafaring, a long history of, of, of voyaging down to Darwin, trading 400 plus years ago. Um, and so they've sort of translated this uh, Punggawa Sawi system, this lord and, and fife system. Uh, that used to operate on the boats into aquaculture, and they've converted. I've been to all these. All these arrows are just places I've seen. So I've been to all the endpoints of those arrows where mangroves have been converted for aquaculture. Um, so recognizing, Indonesia had about 4.2 million hectares of aquaculture of mangroves historically. That's like 10 times as much as the northern territory, and we've lost two plus million hectares. So we've lost half of it, mostly in the last 30 years. Um, Recognizing this, their mangrove restoration has been recommended as a, or at the landscape level, as a way to reverse this uh, trend of degradation, leading recently in the last couple of years to these uh, policy mandates. Kind of, I'm not going to focus on the global one, but Indonesia has made policy in 2017 to restore all of its lost mangroves, which they consider 1.82 million hectares by 2045. And the Coordinating Ministry of Marine Affairs is uh, trying to accelerate that. So restoring all the mangroves, which is about 70,000 hectares of successful restoration a year. Unfortunately, uh, anecdotally, 90 to 99% of mangrove restoration or rehabilitation efforts fail worldwide. Um, a lot of it biophysically, because people plant, well, it's linked. People plant this area beyond the natural extent of a mangrove forest. This is Darwin Harbor. At, this is about mean sea level, and below mean sea level, mangroves don't exist. It's too wet. The mud's too wet, and it, the things in the mud suffocate the root hairs, and mangroves die. This is a planting project in Bali, beyond the natural extent of mangroves, just to plant. They do it annually, and everything dies within six months. So there's a lot of failure. Um, <clears throat> from biophysical perspective, people understand uh, why this fails largely, and there's even a tool online that uses global data to tell us about how restorable any landscape is. I applied this tool to my landscape in Gorontalo, and they say it's 23% restorable from biophysical um, uh, um, metrics alone. But 
Restoring mangroves, uh, this is a paper I'm on recently that was, is written in uh, Brisbane. And um, biophysical aspects or environmental aspects alone are now what dictate restoration opportunities. Also, all these human elements, the social side of things, economic, political, social. Um, I'm going to use social in a broad umbrella sense today when I talk about it, which subsumes a little bit of it, like socioeconomic and political factors. Um, and these need to be addressed. And this is a typical, you know, uh, aquaculture area. This one's actually from Malaysia, not Indonesia. And uh, I just like it because of the fence really illustrates that this was a former commons. Mangroves were common property and it's been privatized. Turning it into little squares that people can own. If it's productive or not, they still like to own this rather than have it as a commons. And I, there's a whole bunch of... Um, things I could say about that. If you don't address social issues, or at the end, this is what, uh, the government in the Nature Reserve was mandated to restore some of that area. And this is a, a film uh, that, that um, from a film that, that we created, about a 25 minute film. And just in the middle of it, Metro News is covering uh, the law enforcement arm of the forestry ministry called Gakum, tearing down a fish farmer's house who's illegally occupying uh, uh, ponds in the nature reserve. So a very, what's the word our, our, our colleagues in Gorontalo call it, it's just an oppressive action to resolve this issue and it's not, it's just, it, it, it's, uh, what's it doing? It's, it's creating a bigger rift between the communities that exist and, and government, um, exacerbating conflict. This is called the Restoration Opportunity Assessment Method, developed by my funders, IUCN and World Resource Institute. They funded our, my research. And this is supposed to be a peaceful, mediative process to identify lands for restoration, forest restoration. I applied it to mangroves in Indonesia in, in the two landscapes. And it, it goes through sort of biophysical assessment, a more of a social assessment, people mapping where they think uh, restoration could take place economic assessment on how much that will cost and how much that will benefit uh, people, and eventually a bit of a policy and finance assessment. So I did all that for my PhD. Um, a lot of field work. This is in the Nature Reserve uh, with a research team from uh, NGO Blue Forests and, and local university in Gorontalo, Wayne Gay. Um, and in the middle of this process, this, there was this opportunity mapping workshop and a validation of that. And we chose stakeholders to join this multi-stakeholder kind of opportunity mapping workshop. And there were 54 potential stakeholders. This is only a partial list over here. And I just, to, to pick who would come, plotted, did a traditional stakeholder analysis, who's interested in mangrove restoration issues, who has influence, and basically you invite this group for sure, and people who have influence who may have not so much interest, and people who have interest and not so much influence. And the goal is to try to get everyone a bit, uh, people who have influence more interested in mangroves, and people who have stakeholders who have um, interest but no influence to get them a little more influence. We don't ignore this lower quadrant, but um, they're not prioritized. Sorry. So you can imagine all those stakeholders sitting in a room for a while learning about and talking and sharing and discussing the system. And at the end of a few days in each landscape, they developed uh, restoration opportunity maps. And in Gorontalo, they did three maps. Uh, this one is a very conservative scenario of restoration, a sort of middling scenario, and, and quite a lot of restoration. This was preferred by the fish farmers who are already operating in the, in the area who have, well, I'll, I'll talk about some of their issues. And they just wanted to give up a little bit of their ponds for restoration, these little green belts. Um, NGO people and people from the university preferred this uh, idea, kind of a, a moderate scenario with a bit more forest patches of restoration. And the government wanted full restoration of the nature reserve, although they had allowed or witnessed or facilitated the conversion of that originally. Um, and what do I want to say? All right, I'll get there. There's a lot of things I could say. I'm trying to figure out what I want to say. This guy is a representative of the KKSS, the South Sulawesi Family Organization. 
8,000 members, and those are all fish farmers who came from South Sulawesi, moved to Tanjung Panjang, and were the, the, the willing actors who converted that landscape. He went through this process and he agrees, like, I'm in, I'm in support of, I'm going to run out of time. I talked five minutes, no worries. Um, so they're in agreement of, of, uh, rest, of restoration, ostensibly, in a multi-stakeholder setting. After these scenarios were developed, we were approached by the Livelihoods Fund. It's um, largely run by Danon, who make avian water, aqua in Indonesia, or yogurt or whatever. And they have a lot of money for uh, CSR, and um, we've tried to work with them before. It's always fallen through. But they came back to Sulawesi and were interested to support. They had 8 million euros to support this restoration. Finance was listed during that workshop as a limitation. So we had money to, to do even that, that big scenario over here, the full landscape. But when they came with the money, we talked to stakeholders again, and everyone said, no, 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 let's not do it. it. It will cause conflict. The fish farmers will revolt, et cetera, et cetera. We're not really ready. So on paper, in the multi-stakeholder group, they said they're ready. But in reality, they were only willing to do this scenario, a little bit of restoration, and down and walked away. They weren't interested, because that's not enough carbon emission reduction for them. They wanted at least the middle scenario, and, and hopefully that, that last scenario. So that took another, uh, like, there's some authors, I'm going to have to speed up on that. There's some authors who talk about the things that go on in multi-stakeholder meetings do not consider power relations between uh, groups like the fish farmers versus the government. And so we went back and did uh, interviews with just fish farmers in their houses and did some content analysis on those interviews to bring out some latent themes that you know were serving as social barriers or constraints to restoration. Um, this is that process of, I'm just showing my work here a little bit, this is part of qualitative content analysis, developing uh, meeting units and condensing those, developing codes and categories. Eventually, we arrived at five themes, me and two researchers from Indonesia. And I'm going to just try to run through a little bit of these themes, which kind of proceed uh, chronologically in a way. Transgression. So when the people first came to this landscape, they came from South Sulawesi. Their area was already fully converted, and a lot of it was uh, diseased. Aquaculture wasn't valuable there, and they, because of their cultural history of, of voyaging, they, they, they cruise around East Indonesia, and these unregulated mangrove areas are easy, easy targets to, to convert. Um, so that's taking place a little bit. Um, the aquaculture in this region was very profitable. The average farmer makes 14,000 US dollars a year, which is quite a lot of money um, in the Indonesian setting. And some larger farmers make huge amounts of money. Um, in some landscapes, aquaculture is not successful. People still do it, kind of to control the land. But in this case, it's very, uh, for 20 years, aquaculture has been productive. So there's a lot of, we call that an opportunity cost of restoration. How do you offset that opportunity cost? Conflict has come and gone in this area. The government every now and then gets, you know, Jokowi flew over in 2016 said, what's wrong with that place? That's a nature reserve. Oh, well, we need to send the force, the Gakum, yeah, the force enforcement unit up there to try to resolve these issues. So conflict has come and gone in the 2010, 13, 16, and people just tend to wait it out because they think it's just a political movement. Um, but it does make people stressed and vulnerable, and you know, especially you know, especially some families who come up and join, and they're in the system where you know they don't know what the use of a nature reserve is necessarily. They just know this aquaculture livelihood, and they want to keep it going, and they don't understand why stakeholders are against them sometimes. Um, fish farmers, by and large, don't value mangroves. Uh, red carp, okay, so not understanding how you can make a livelihood off of just a healthy mangrove system is, is also a potential barrier. And finally, um, livelihood alternatives are not clear. They've been fish farming in South Sulawesi for generations. Uh, they don't own any other land up in Gorontalo. We can't transition them to, land, to uh, agriculture or forest use or capture fisheries. So they're very likely, if they're forced out of the landscape, they'll go somewhere else and convert it. And right now, a lot of people in that landscape own land certificates in Kalimantan, in a, in a place called Barao, 
where they're ready to open more ponds. This is the Mahakam Delta um, in East Kalimantan. The same thing happened. Almost the entire delta was switched to aquaculture. That was mangrove forest cover over time. This is aquaculture. Um, but in this system, there is a livelihood alternative that's being explored. It's the nipa palm, which is a mangrove, and you can uh, create sugar or bioethanol out of it. And it's possible to transition some of the fish farmer, especially the wealthier fish farmers, into that industry, which can be managed sustainably. But not every landscape has that livelihood alternative. This is my final slide, so, and this is all theoretical and, and it wasn't uh, received well by my supervisors yesterday. <laughs> but it's still in the slideshow. This is the adaptive cycle, a process of change um, over time. When something is in an early growth phase, a conservation phase, there's some kind of release and then it uh, reorganizes and regrows, right? You can apply this to a mangrove forest. In this case, I, I applied it to the aquaculture uh, development, where people left the South Sulawesi landscape, developed aquaculture in, in Gorontalo, maintained that aquaculture, and now they're at a point of contention where people are saying, you've got to restore some of this. And what are they going to do? They may revolt, wait out the conflict, and go back into what they're doing. Or they may run away to a new system, which we call leakage, which if we were going to do restoration with carbon finance, isn't allowed. So there's still no clarity on what's going to happen in the future. And I think the big point of my talk here is that a lot of mangrove people are biophysical scientists. No one's a social scientist who specializes only in mangroves. But there's a great need for more social science to address this complicated uh, problem. And uh, we recently published a little note in Nature um, that one of these social issues, land tenure, is a major consideration uh, limiting successful mangrove restoration. And I just want to invite social scientists to come investigate this issue with us as we try to achieve Indonesia's ambitious goal of full restoration by starting out at landscape scales and then scaling up to the country. Thanks.